spotlighted baseball player of 1970 went four and six with an ERA of 5.42 for the Astros Jim Bouton who tosses the knuckleball threw a curve at Major League Baseball writing a tell-all book called Ball Four players popping greenies before games peeping toms on road trips far out James Allen Bouton was born on March 8, 1939 in Newark New Jersey he grew up in the working-class suburb of Rochelle Park New Jersey where he spent the first 13 years of his life developing an overhand fastball in early infancy and a monster curveball by the age of eight. Rochelle Park was a place where, as Bouton himself notes, young boys and their fathers without fail rooted for one of two baseball teams, the Brooklyn Dodgers or the New York Giants. Rooting for the Yankees in this blue-collar town was tantamount to worshiping a false idol, or at the very least, betraying one's social class. As Bouton explained in a June 2012 New York Times article, nobody rooted for the Yankees in Rochelle Park. Yankee fans, we believed, were the sons of bankers who lived in towns with bigger houses and nicer lawns. When Jim was 13 years old, his father, George Boughton, moved the family to nearby Ridgewood, New Jersey, one of those towns with bigger houses, a place where Boughton's identity as a Giants fan became increasingly problematic. But the discomfort was of short duration, for two years later, George's job took the family even farther afield, to Chicago Heights, Illinois, a southern suburb of Chicago in solidly White Sox country. There, young Jim tried out for the Bloom Township baseball team as a pitcher and barely made the squad, seeing limited action that earned him the nickname Warm Up Boughton until his junior year. By the end of his senior season, Boughton had established himself at Bloom Township. He pitched a no-hitter, excelled as an American League pitcher, and earned a scholarship to play baseball at Western Michigan University. Just after his freshman year in college in the summer of 1958, Boughton pitched in a Chicago amateur league where he was scouted by several major league teams and offered a $30,000 signing bonus by the Yankees. He spent 59, the, 60, and 61 seasons in the minor leagues, and in spring training of 1962, he earned a spot as the last man on the Yankees pitching staff, beating out an aging Robin Roberts and securing the uniform number 56, which he wore for the rest of his career to remind him of how far he had come against all odds. I used to keep a list of pitchers who were above me on the ladder, Boughton would write years later. My first year, I wrote down 134 names. Guys were running around with numbers on their backs like 78 and 84. One spring, my number was 68. I was a pulling guard. Boughton followed his 7-7 seven and seven rookie campaign with the New York Yankee in 1962 by posting marks of 21-7 and seven in 1963 and 18-13 and in 1964, including two World Series victories over the St. Louis Cardinals. After injuring his arm in 1965, he struggled through three more seasons with the Yankees before attempting to resurrect his career in 1969 as a knuckleball pitcher with the Seattle Pilots and Houston Astros. Boughton began writing a diary during that season, and the end result, Ball Four, published in 1970, became arguably the most influential baseball book ever written. Baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn tried to suppress it, asking Boughton to sign a statement that the book was fictional. Boughton refused. The owners were furious. Bowie Kuhn, who was the commissioner of baseball, comes out and tries to have the book banned which is ridiculous. All it got was people wanting to read it. Bowie Kuhn uh, called me in for a reprimand. He wanted to stop the presses. He wanted to keep this book from being published. He didn't want anybody to read it. It was bad judgment on his part. That there were things that were sacrosanct that ought to stay among the players and the managers and the coaches. And it just wasn't good form, good idea, good stuff. It was a bad thing to do. It was embarrassing. After several poor outings in the middle of the 1970 season, Boughton retired from baseball. And then his post-baseball career took off with rounds on a variety of TV shows, including this appearance on What's My Line in October of 1970. All right, mystery challenger, will you enter and sign in, please? Well, uh, have you um, uh, also written a book? I thought you'd never ask. Uh, yeah. Jim Bolton? Uh, so, oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, oh Jim. Yeah.
there was the obligatory guest visit to The Tonight Show. Uh, my middle son, David, bet uh, somebody $5 that uh, I wouldn't make it, and he lost his bet. Mm -hmm. I would put that kid up for adoption tomorrow. <laughs> That's Somebody... how we got him. <laughs> Boughton then embarked on what should have been a short-lived acting career, as exemplified by his role in the 1973 Robert Altman film The Long Goodbye, starring Elliot Gould as Private Eye Philip Marlowe and Boughton as Terry Lennox, his friend and, as it turns out, you, wife murder. You'll never learn. You're a born loser. Yeah, I even lost my cat. <laughs> Had Altman allowed Boughton's character to punch out a horse, perhaps his acting career would have taken off in meteoric fashion, but alas, it was not to be. Undeterred by this box office bomb and a personal performance that a critic from the New York Sun recently termed both the beginning and the end of Boughton's film career, Boughton created, wrote, and starred in a TV series based on Ball Four, which aired in 1976 and lasted all of five episodes before CBS unceremoniously canceled it. Any chance of me getting into the game tonight? Have you got a ticket? <laughs> as badly acted as it was, however, the show was notable for having among its cast of characters a gay rookie ball player, one of the earliest regular gay characters on television, as well as ex-Oakland Raiders defensive end Big Ben Davidson, all six feet eight inches of him, playing the role of a catcher aptly named Rhino. He would hit the quarterback while he was getting in the car with his girlfriend after the ball game. That was not a late hit to Ben. During the first seven years after his retirement from the big leagues, Boughton kept busy as a highly popular sportscaster in New York City. But in 1977, he gave up his television career to attempt a comeback in baseball. Boughton wrote of his decision to return to the games that shunned him, saying, Why would I even want to go back? It's hard to explain. I felt a certain restlessness. It seemed like I had to find something, but I didn't know what. He persuaded Ted Turner to give him a shot with the Braves' Southern League affiliate in Savannah, where he relied on his knuckleball to finish the 1978 campaign with an 11-9 and record and a 2.82 ERA. And he has. Boughton was called up to the parent club in September, started five games, pitched well in three of them, and finished 1-3 and three with an ERA of 4.91. This is Madlock, who leads the National League in hitting. The 1-2. Got him. Strikeout. Boughton retired again at the end of the 1978 season, saying that he had found a thing inside himself for which he had been looking. Now I could release my grip on baseball, Boughton wrote. Baseball had released its grip on me. Although Boughton left his mark on the game as a player, having won two World Series games for the 1964 Yankees and earning the distinction of being the only player to make it to the big leagues twice from scratch, it is primarily ball four for which he is known. Banned from participating in the Old Timers Day at Yankee Stadium from 1970 to 1998, when the ban was finally lifted, derided by the baseball establishment for decades, shunned by former teammates, two of whom declined to be interviewed for this video, Boughton endured the wrath of a generation for telling the truth about the game and its greatest practitioners. But he always contended, and still contends, that those whom he most defended were baseball's owners, which Ball Four exposed in all their greed, and a contingent of old-time sports writers who suffered from a form of literary envy. In your book, is you suggest that the coaches and managers have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, they have no effect. Is well, that true? Uh, well, at that time it was. Right. You know, today, I, I don't know what, you know what impact the manager has or what impact the coaches have because I'm really not close enough to the game. But back then... Um, the manager was usually, you know, some former player who everybody liked. Mm -hmm. And then he chose a coaching staff made up of basically his drinking buddies. I mean, yeah. so that was, Can you explain the impact the book had in 1970 when it came out? Well, uh, there was uh, a, a great deal of objection from two quarters. One was the sports writers yeah, uh, because they didn't have the access I had and uh, they had been sort of pushing, uh, uh, you know, a milk and cookies, uh, Boy Scout uh, kind of uh, view of players. Right. Also, the owners were against the book because Ball Four was the first book to tell people how difficult it was to make a living. But uh, I put the front offices down, and they, they're entitled to it. They deserve it. <laughs> what isn't so well known about Boughton is his long and quite impressive career as a political activist, a career that has expressed itself in myriad ways, but which is perhaps best symbolized by his anti-war involvement and his participation at the 1972 Democratic National Convention as a delegate for George McGovern. As vice chairman of the New Jersey delegation, 
Boughton had the distinction of standing at the microphone during the roll call in the early morning hours of July 13, 1972. You may have seen me on television at 4 o'clock in the morning, Boughton writes 18 years later, announcing that the great and sovereign state of New Jersey, boycotters of non-union lettuce, was casting its votes for George McGovern. The administration tells us that we should not discuss tax reform in an election year. They would prefer to keep all discussion of the tax laws in closed rooms where the administration, its powerful friends, and their paid lobbyists can turn every effort at reform into a new loophole for the rich and powerful. The 1972 convention was significant in that it was the first one to implement the reform set by the Commission on Party Structure and Delegate Selection, which McGovern himself had chaired before running for president. The commission set guidelines ordering state parties to prohibit proxy voting, do away with winner-take-all primaries, and establish new quotas mandating that certain percentages of delegates be women or members of minority groups. These changes, says Boughton, resulted in an entirely new and a more egalitarian kind of democratic convention. Jim Boughton keeps himself busy today with a variety of activist causes, including turning down invitations for speaking engagements with the Boy Scouts of America due to the organization's ban on gay scouts. In 2003, he got deeply involved in a fight to save Wakona Park, a vintage minor league baseball stadium near his home in the heart of the Berkshires that was slated for demolition. Boughton's spirited campaign to preserve the park against the wishes of the city leaders of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, saved it from the wrecking ball and earned Boughton scores of additional enemies, many of whom he sent signed copies of Ball Four. Among Boughton's most recent projects is an appearance in the 2012 documentary film Knuckleball, which was filmed throughout the 2011 baseball season, and which details the frustrations and triumphs of R.A. Dickey and Tim Wakefield, respectively, during Wakefield's final season. Noting the universal disrespect that knuckleballers are accorded and the pariah status they endure even among their own teammates, Boughton voices one of the film's most memorable lines. In order to throw the knuckleball, says Boughton, you need the fingers of a safecracker and the mind of a Zen Buddhist. It is altogether fitting, then, that Boughton's anti-establishment career as a player, writer, and social activist has always been accompanied by a zen-like patience as well as his trademark bulldog determination. As Boughton writes at the end of the 20th anniversary edition of Ball Four, there is too much poverty, too much greed, and too much ignorance in the land. As one of the lucky ones, I'd like to help make things better. Fortunately for us, he already has.